Before we get started, uh, I want to want you to turn to a verse of scripture in Isaiah 46. Isaiah chapter number 46. Before we get into Revelation chapter number uh, 12. Isaiah chapter number 46. And in Isaiah chapter number 46, the prophet of old gives us an idea on understanding or deciphering Bible prophecy. Many would ask the question, just exactly what is Bible prophecy? It is next week's newspaper written today. That's what Bible prophecy is. It is a look into the future according to God's plan of specific events that are going to take place. When the book of Genesis was written, it predicted that Jesus Christ was going to be born. All throughout the Old Testament, there were prophecies pointing to Christ. There's prophecies in the book of Daniel that talks about different world empires. One prophecy named King Cyrus 150 years before he ever lived and called him by name. You see, Bible prophecy tells us what's going to happen in the future. But one of the things that we have to understand about Bible prophecy, many of the things that has happened in the past will repeat itself again in the future as it fulfills itself in a dual prophecy. Look what it says in Isaiah 46, verse number 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Now notice verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says, look, I am going to declare the end from the beginning. I'm going to let you understand what's going to happen in the future. And some of the things God spoke, it was in generalities, if you would. I don't know if that's a proper terminology. My son actually told me it wasn't, but I like the word. It's kind of like strategery that President Bush used. Sure did sound good. So anyway, uh, he spoke in general terms, but there are also prophecies that are specific. And I mean, tells some tell the exact dates of what's going to happen. Uh, some tells us uh, the exact people that are going to be involved. And so here, if we're going to understand Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy is declaring the end from the beginning and declaring what was sometimes is going to be again. And so when we come up to Revelation chapter number 12, and I want you to take your Bible and turn there, in Revelation chapter number 12, we find that there are seven personages described in this chapter. Once again, this is a parenthetical chapter. In other words, by saying it's a parenthetical chapter, God has put some parentheses around it, and he takes a pause to explain in detail what is happening before the timeline moves forward. I hope everybody understands that. So if you look up here at the tribulation map on the PowerPoint program, when we are in Revelation chapter number 12, uh, we, are, we have just finished up the, uh, the trumpet judgments. And now he is pausing to explain what is taking place. And 
he is actually describing a war in heaven. Now, this war in heaven was, and it is, and one day it shall be again. Declaring the end from the, the beginning. When we look at Revelation chapter number 12, we find this war took place. And it took place between God and Lucifer. And in some aspects, that war is still going. When, and Brother Gary, I know that you've been overseas and you're in Afghanistan and, and uh, there was war that took place. But in the midst of that war, how many battles were there? Many. All right? So when we stop and think about this war that takes place in Revelation chapter 12, there's many battles. The battle is still raging for you and I. Every day I get up, I've got to fight a battle. I've got to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil every day. And so do you as a Christian. In Revelation chapter number 12, we find this battle being described. And this battle, like I said, it's not just futuristic, although it is futuristic, certain aspects. But this battle, it started a long, long time ago. It started before Adam and Eve. It's going on right now. And you know what? The devil would love to win the battle in your life. So throughout the book of Revelation, we find many interesting phrases. And I just want to go ahead and point these out. Uh, there are, the, the number seven is revealed over and over and over. Now, in the Bible, there is, uh, if you do an extensive study of the Bible, you'll find that biblical numerology comes up. Uh, it is not a hocus-pocus thing, but there is, a, there is biblical numerology throughout the Bible that teaches us certain things. Like, for example, uh, the number three talks about God. It's about the Trinity, all right? One is the number of unity, all right? Uh, and just different numbers. Number five is the number of death. You read Genesis chapter 5. They lived so long and they died. They lived so long and they died. All in Genesis 5. Number 5 also is the number of grace. You know, we cannot have grace until, first of all, someone had to die. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 6 is the number of man. Number 7 is the number of perfection or completion. All through the book of Revelation, you'll find the number seven mentioned over and over and over. And there's a reason for that. It's because God is wrapping things up. God is coming to a conclusion on things. In Genesis, we find that paradise was lost all because of sin. In Revelation, we find that paradise is restored and so we find in the book of Revelation, for example, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches. Revelation 4, the seven spirits. In Revelation 5, the seven sealed book. In Revelation 6, the beginning of the seventh seal judgments. And then Revelation 8, the beginning of the seven trumpet judgments. Revelation 12 and 13 will be on chapter 13 next week, Lord willing. We're going to be talking about the seven personages. There's seven people that are mentioned or persons that are mentioned in these, chap these next two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 13, that describe what we are going to face. And next week, we're going to be talking about two of those, and that is going to be the false the false uh, prophet and the Antichrist, who is going to, they're going to be running the one world government. And uh, don't miss that. That's going to be Revelation chapter 13. 
So there's the seven personages. And then Revelation 16 deals with the seven vile judgments. Those are the final judgments upon the face of the earth. God is done. God is complete with the wrath of God poured out upon the world. And then in Revelation 17 through Revelation 19, there are seven dooms that are pronounced. In Revelation 17, 9, it talks about the seven mountains. And then in Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation 22, there are seven new things. Talking about heaven. Seven, like I said, is the number of completion, the number of of a completeness or the number of perfection. In Revelation, God is making a complete end of sin and sorrow. He will complete his wonderful plan of redemption for all creation. Paradise with all of its original glory and more is restored in Revelation 21 and 22. In the first few chapters of Genesis, like I said, paradise is lost. The last two chapters, paradise is restored. So I want to look at Revelation chapter 12, and I want to go through this verse by verse and show you the first five of these persons that are mentioned or personages. Look at verse number one. There are a... There And there appeared a great wonder. Let me pause. The word wonder, if you look up the word wonder in your dictionary, it means a sign. So God is going to have a sign appear, a wonder or a sign in heaven. And then it says, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon was under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. In, in verse number one and two, we find that this personage is described, and she is clothed with the sun. She had the moon under her feet. She had a crown on her head. And the crown was made up of 12 stars. And she was great to be with child. By the way, this woman is not the church. This woman is not Mary. This woman is not the founder of Christian science. Mary Baker Eddie Glover Patterson was her name. She said that she was that woman. Foolish. But who is this woman? Well, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 37. The book of Genesis chapter number 37. And I, I didn't write it down, but I think that's the chapter. We remember Joseph. Joe, Brother Joe has been speaking about Joseph. And uh, Joseph had a dream. And he dreamed a dream and he told it to his brothers. And he said in verse 7, Behold, the, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Needless to say, that did not make his older brothers happy. What he was saying is, all of you older brothers, you're going to bow down before me one day. Joseph told the dream. He didn't even know what the dream meant. He just said, hey, I had this dream. It's really weird. I, you know. But look what it says in verse number 9. And he dreamed yet another dream. This is very important. This is prophetic. And told it his brethren and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. 
So who is the sun and who is the moon? Well, in this dream, it is his mother and father. And the 11 stars are his brothers. And Joseph would have been the 12th. So here we find a prophecy about the children of Israel. Now, it goes on, it says, and he told it to his father, verse number 10, and to his brother, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? By the way, they did that. When they ran out of food in Egypt, they sent the brothers there to Egypt. And, uh, of course, we, we know the story. Brother Joe's been doing a good job uh, speaking about that in Sunday school. But it all boiled down to the fact that God sent Joseph ahead in order to save everyone's life. And they all bowed down before Joseph. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder or a sign where? Was it on earth? No, it was in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Well, the question is, who is that woman? We'll get to that here in just a minute. Clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. We look at verse number 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Beside of verse number 5, you might want to write in a margin of your Bible, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was that man-child that was born. In verse number, verse number 1, we find that this woman, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars, she's ready to be delivered, and now she gives birth. This woman is none other than the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, not Mary, not some cult leader. It's not even the church. It's, it's the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel brought forth a son. In Galatians chapter number 4 and verse number 4, through six, it says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. God sent forth his son. So we find as the first personage is being described, this woman that is being described is Israel. All right? Look what it says in verse number three. And there appeared another wonder, and that's the same word, another sign in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. By the way, in Revelation 12, you're going to find that there is a great wonder in heaven. There is a great red dragon. We find that in verse number 9, it talks about the great dragon. Uh, we also find in verse number 12, there's great wrath and there's also a great eagle. That phrase, great, is mentioned over and over. There's something that is, are you ready for this? Mega. That's the Greek word it comes from. It's not just about Trump. It's about the Bible, all right? It's mega. Make America great again. Well, before America was ever ever come into being, uh, that word was here in the Bible. Amen? So there's a, a, a lot of great things that are happening. Verse 3, there appeared another wonder or a sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads 
and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And he, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now, in the Bible, the stars, sometimes they're in reference to people. Sometimes, prophetically, they're in reference to angelic beings. Sometimes they're in reference to the celestial bodies in the sky. Well, we know that it's not in reference to the celestial stars in the sky because of those things are much, much larger than the earth and they couldn't be thrown down to the earth. It's possible that it's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. This, the previous verses was talking about them being stars. And maybe this red dragon is going to subdue part of Israel. Those stars mentioned in verse number one. And so we find here the great red dragon. And he had ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Seven heads and ten horns. And he drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Now we also find in the past that Lucifer, when Lucifer rebelled against God before Adam and Eve fell, that he took a third of the angels in heaven and created a rebellion against God. And because of that, we find that there is a war that started. A war between God and Lucifer. Now called Satan. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. By the way, what did it Herod do when he found out that he was mocked of the wise men. He sent his soldiers out to kill all the children from two years old and younger to try to destroy the Christ child. Verse 5, and she brought forth a man child who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. You'll find that in Isaiah chapter number 2 and verse number 4. And I'm not going to have time to look up all these verses, but they're on your outline. I would encourage you to take some time and look these up. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6 and 7. Isaiah 65, verse 21 through verse number 24. Genesis chapter number 49, verse number 10. Talking about the scepter, God's scepter, and the Messiah who is going to rule. So we find here the second person, verse 3 and 4, is Satan. He's called Lucifer. He's called the red, great red dragon, verse number 3. Isaiah 14, verse 12, he is called Lucifer, the shining one. In verse number 3, he has political power. I think Ronald Reagan's the one that said the scariest words that you ever hear is, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. When the government shows up, it's usually not to help. And when the Antichrist shows up, he is not going to show up to help. Not at all. We find here that he tries to destroy the work of God. It says here that the one that was brought forth, he was going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And notice this, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Where is Jesus Christ right now? He is sitting on the right hand of the throne on high where he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. And so Jesus Christ is in heaven right now. 
But verse 3 tells us that Satan is going to come and he is going to have political power during the tribulation period and during his time leading the one world government in Revelation chapter 13. He has his companions, verse number 4. He drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Satan has his demons that followed him. And I believe that that's what this is talking about. The angels, very probable in reference to the stars. He has a plan, verse 4, to destroy the Christ and just destroy the followers of Christ. The devil is not our friend, Christian. You know, it disturbs me when so many Christians will go out and get involved in Halloween. It is satanic to the core. Satanic. Why should we teach? Listen, you can teach your children good things and moral things without being involved in the occult. I don't think churches ought to be involved in it. I know churches are having, all over, they're having trunk or treat. What are we teaching our children? Well, it's okay to, to dabble with the occult and witchcraft and glorify the dead if it's just a fun holiday for the kids you know after all it's just a preacher don't get so uptight about things it's just a fun holiday for the kids it's occultic I mean every aspect of Halloween is occultic I don't think a Christian ought to have anything to do with it now uh, listen if you do you're not going to go to hell but what type of testimony are, do you have I've got people that are around that live around me man they've got they've done it up big I mean they've got skeletons out there and witches out there flying in the trees and and all kinds of stuff they had to spend thousands of dollars on this stuff I think I've got a lot better use of my money amen Satan verse 4 has a plan to destroy the work of God. That's the Christ child. He has a plan to destroy the people of God. Look what it says in verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That's the job of Satan. The job of Satan is to deceive. He wants to deceive us. He wants to deceive our children. Well, you know, it's not that bad. After all, it's just a little bit of fun. It's not going to hurt anybody. You know, I hear all of these things. By the way, sin always affects us. And sin will always hurt us. Always will. Always has. Look at verse 13 through 16. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out into, unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. If the woman is Israel, and I believe it is according to the context, what country on earth has been more persecuted than Israel? Even today, with what's going on over in Israel, they're being attacked by the people in Gaza. They're being attacked by the people in Lebanon. They're being attacked by Iran. They, were, they had missiles lobbed at them from uh, Syria. Listen, all the way around them, they are being attacked, and it's not over yet.
persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the wilderness unto her place, where she shall be nourished for a time and times and a half a time. By the way, that's three and a half years. A time in the Bible is one year. Times, plural, is two years, and then a half a time is a half of a year. So you have a total of three and a half years, which in another passage it talks about 1,203 score days, which is 1,260 days, which is exactly three and a half years also. Those terms are used throughout the book of Revelation. And so here we find that Satan tries to destroy the people of God. And the serpent was cast out of his mouth, water as a flood, verse 15, after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So here we find that Satan is trying to destroy the work of God and the people of God. By the way, that which was is still today, and yet we'll see it again in the future. We're in a battle right now because Satan is trying to destroy the people of God. We are in a battle. You're in a battle. Declaring the end from the beginning. And we see this just repeat itself over the ascension. After, after the resurrection, Jesus Christ walked on the earth for 40 days. And then he went to the Mount of Olives. The disciples were there. And all of a sudden, he started going up. And a cloud received him out of, out of their sight. And two angels stood by and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which went up... From you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. And so he was caught up to heaven. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 9 through verse number 11. Where is Jesus Christ right now? He is in heaven. And he is in intercede, he's interceding for us. And he's waiting for the Father to say, go get my children. And he's going to step out into the clouds and the trumpet is going to sound. And listen, there's going to be a shout from the archangel and we're going to be caught up in the presence of God. By the way, as far as Satan goes, a lot of people think have this weird idea about Satan. That Satan is in hell right now running around with a red suit and with the horns on his head and a pitchfork, and everybody that's in hell, he goes around and he sticks them from time to time. That is not in, in the Bible. That isn't even good mythology. Matter of fact, if you do a study of the scripture, you will find an interesting thing. Satan has never been to hell. Matter of fact, Satan will never be in hell. Now wait a minute. Before you say I'm a heretic, you listen. Satan one day will be cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10. But Satan is not there now. Right now, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he is accusing us before God day and night. Somehow, and when he was kicked out of heaven in the past, who was he? Can anybody tell me who, who Lucifer was? Yes. He was the light bearer. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. Ezekiel 28 describes his tabrets and his pipes. He was the music man in heaven. God is light, the Bible says. And he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He covered the glory of God from the rest of the universe. And as the, the light of God flowed through Satan, the universe was filled with beautiful music. 
then he fell. You read Ezekiel 28, you read Isaiah 14, and it describes what he did. And Satan was cast out. He was cast out from the presence of the throne. But the Bible says he is the prince and the power of the air. The Bible tells us also, and that was Ephesians 2 and verse 2. The Bible also tells us that Satan accuses us day and night before the throne of God. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. And so as he accuses us day and night, Revelation 12 and verse number 9, he has access. And I, I look at it this way, that Satan was kicked out of the throne room of God. No longer is he the anointed cherub that covereth. No longer is the light of God flowing through him to spread through all of the universe the glories of God. That's not Lucifer's position. Now he's the accuser of the brethren. The word accuser. Does anybody know where that word comes from? It comes from the, the word diablo. Devil. By the way, Christian... The accuser of the brethren. What did he do? He accuses us day and night before God. He, when all of a sudden he sees or he hears that we do something wrong, he runs up to the, I, this is how I picture it. Maybe my picture is all wrong. But he runs up to the, to the gates of the city and says, God, did you see what Derek did? Did you see what Jennifer did? Did you see what Rick Browning did? And he accuses us day and night before the throne of God. He doesn't have access to the throne. But he is accusing us. Slandering us. He is the, the Diablo. The devil. By the way, in Titus chapter number 2, it talks about women not being false accusers. Women, listen to me, ladies. Don't be false. The word accuser there is the word diablo. Don't be a she-devil, all right? Ladies, don't be a she-devil. And fellas, don't be a macho devil, all right? Listen, we, we ought to not do the work of, of the devil. We ought to do the work of God. We are, not to, we are not to be accusing the brethren and slandering the brethren. Amen? So we find in verse number five, there was the child. He was to rule the, the earth with a rod of iron. He is caught up to the throne of God and this is Jesus Christ and then look at verse 7 through verse number 12 and there was what in heaven war well, when did this war begin it's been a long war it started before Adam and Eve you say how do you know that because the fall of Satan took place I believe, before the creation of man because the serpent was already in the garden tempting Adam and Eve. Now, there could have been a period of time between the creation of man and the fall of Satan. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I do know this. Satan was there in the garden. He's the one that asked the very first question in the Bible, Genesis 3, 6. Yea, hath God said? Isn't that interesting? The devil's been questioning the authority of the word of God ever since. So here we find that there's a war. Michael and his angels 
fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels. Verse 8, and prevailed not. The dragon did not win. Amen. The dragon loses. And prevailed not. Now notice this. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. No longer. Listen. The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. By the way. When you're praying, there's some things you probably ought to just pray silently to yourself. Amen? You praise God out loud. You confess your sins privately in your heart before God. Don't even tell the devil what they are. Because he'll just bring more temptation your way. There's a long war. Michael begins to fight. The, Michael is the archangel. He is the chief of the angels. He is mentioned five times in scripture. He's mentioned in Daniel 10, Daniel chapter number 12, verse 1. He's mentioned in the book of Jude. Uh, Jude calls him the archangel. He's mentioned in Revelation 12, verse number 7. Listen, he is mentioned. And every time he's mentioned, he, it's in connection with the nation of Israel. Michael is the warring angel and he is the one that stands and protects Israel I am not worried about Iran destroying Israel because God has his angel and he is going to protect Israel it doesn't make any difference if America supports Israel or not. Now, I believe if we want blessings on us, we need to. But that, listen, God is going to protect. That's what Michael is actually is. Look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter number 12. The book of Ezekiel and then the book of Daniel. And look what it says in verse number 1. At that time shall Michael stand up. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time, and that time thy people shall be delivered, every one of them, or excuse me, every one that shall be found written in the book. There is coming a time of trouble like there's never been upon the face of the earth. And Michael is going to stand up for the people of God, which is Israel. And so the archangel, Jude verse number 9, he is the highest of all angels. He is connected with leading and protecting the Jewish people. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 1. He is connected with war. Go over to the book of Jude, if you would, please. Right before the book of Revelation, the book of Jude, look at verse number 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And so it is connected with war. He was in a battle. Satan... And Michael were in a battle. And then I want you to notice verse Revelation chapter number 12. Look at what it says in verse number 13 through 17. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth. Now right now Satan is not in hell or he's not in hell. Uh, Satan has access, a limited access to heaven. You read the book of, book of Job. Satan comes and presents himself to God along with the other angels that were there. Said, God says, 
Satan, what, what are you doing? What have, what have you been up to? And he saw, he says, just walking up and down upon the earth. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Listen, Satan and all of his demons are actively working against every Christian. They're blinding the eyes of those that are lost so that they would not get saved. It goes on, it says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast out of the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. God's got a place prepared for Israel to protect her. In the past, there was a place called Masada where they held off the Roman invasion for months. It says where she's going to be nourished for three and a half years from the face of the serpent. Verse 15. And the serpent was cast, cast out of his mouth a flood. Verse 16. And the earth helped the woman and opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I only can think about the flood that is going on right now. The political flood. The verbal flood of accusations that is being leveled against our former president. Vicious. And the same type of flood of words and accusations are going to be going out against Israel to the point to where Lucifer, or the, the old dragon, is going to do all that he can to convince the world we need to wipe Israel off the face of the earth because they are the source of all of our trouble. And there's going to, they're going to attempt a genocide that will look, make Hitler's genocide in World War II look like a Sunday school picnic. It's coming. We find in verse 17, and the dragon was wroth. He was angry because God intervened in the destruction of Israel. By the way, God is always going to intervene in the destruction of Israel because Israel is still God's people. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now notice this, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we find his protection was not only on the Jewish people, but at this particular time in Jew the Jewish history, they are turning to Jesus Christ by the droves and becoming Christians. Go back to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. And I want you to look at this verse again and I'm going to close. What about them? Yes, they are. He is going to keep them safe, and he is going to protect them, and. Uh, 
Israel, there's going to be a, a great time of conversion during the tribulation period. They're going to turn to Christ. Remember, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Listen, God is going to work it all out. And what he has told us in the past is going to be completed in the future. And we've seen this over and over and over as it cycles through history. Verse 17, there is a Jewish remnant that God keeps. God and Satan both have a plan for eternity. He has a plan. Revelation 12 gives us an understanding of God's plan for Bible prophecy. So does Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. All prophetic events have been foreshadowed in the past, will one day be completed in the future. What a glorious day when God's plan will come about in complete totality. Right now, we just need to let the Lord have his way in our life. Amen? Let's bow forward in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we look at this passage, Lord, help us to realize that you've got a plan. And Lord, you've got it all worked out. Lord, help us to trust you. Guide us and direct us, I pray. Lord, I pray that you'd work in lives. Draw us to thee, I pray. Lord, if there's anyone here that's not prepared themselves to meet thee, Lord, I pray that you'd get it taken care of once and for all. Thank you.